Today, we're starting from absolute zero and learning Python together. Whether you've never coded before or you're just curious about Python, this is the perfect place to begin. And by the end of this video, you'll know how to install Python, set up an IDE and what that even means and understand the basics to kickstart your coding journey. So let's dive in. First of all, you'll want to install Python and you do that by going over to python.org. Once you're here, if you go over to download, you can find the latest version recommended for your system. I'm on Windows, so I can press this. If you are on Mac, just click that and find the very latest one. Now, once you've downloaded it, I have already got it installed, but I'll follow along the steps with you. Is you'll want to open up this installer. Importantly, make sure you click add to path down here and then press install now. But let's talk about Python because it comes with its own built in editor called the IDLE. Now, if you want to use this, go down to your taskbar here and search for it. What this is, is a very lightweight editor for writing and running Python code. We're going to get a little bit ahead of ourselves and just show you how to run some code. But let's create a new file and then try this print. This is the very first thing you'll learn to run in Python. Once we've saved the file, if we go to run module, you'll see we get hello world. Now this isn't the best environment and it's a little bit roundabout. Now idle is a great place to experiment with code, but for larger projects, you'll want something more powerful. That's where PyCharm comes in. So let's set up PyCharm, a professional grade tool that makes writing Python code easier and more organized. Now, make sure you head over to the PyCharm website on JetBrains. You'll find that here. It should be the first link. And again, all of this will be linked in the description as well. It's completely free if you go for the community edition, which is what we'll be doing today. So let's download. And not the professional one, but we'll actually want to scroll down and get the community edition. And then again, press download and follow the steps. This is what you'll be presented with when you open PyCharm for the very first time. What we'll want to do is head over and press create a new project or new project, and we'll want to give it a name. Now I'll save that to a location on my desktop called PyCharm. This is going to create a folder for you to save all your projects. I'm just going to call this personal project Python project, or maybe we'll call it tutorial. Once we've chosen a location, we can actually then press create. Now this is the directory here. You can see you have the folder alongside that. You have all your different scripts as well inside this virtual environment. Now I'm going to right click here and I'm going to create a new Python file and I'm just going to call it file one. Once I've done that, I'm ready to go. You can see that's inside here. So let's begin. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to start with our first ever program. Let's write that here. We're going to type print and I'll zoom in for you as well. And then brackets inside quotation marks. If we press one quotation mark, it will automatically give us two. We'll write hello world. Now to run this, all you have to do is press this play button up at the top and you'll see easily down here in the same window. There we go. Hello world. You've just written your first Python program. Congratulations. Now let's cover the basics of Python. I'll break it down into some simple projects. Let's talk about variables. Now variables are containers used to store information. Here's an example. Let's say name is equal to Toby. Age is equal to 25 or 24 and print Hello, my name is Toby and I'm 24. Now let's run that. Fantastic. What if though, I just wanted to call the variable because maybe my name changes and my age will as well. So what I have to do here is I specifically call it an F string. This is a formatted string and allows me to bring in variables. So here, I can put inside curly brackets name. 
and here I can put age. So now when I update this and I say my name's Jamie and I press run, it will update down here. Same with age as well. I'm 244 years old. There we go. Now what that means is if I have a lot of different places where I'm talking about my name and age, I only need to update it in one place because it's contained and stored inside the variable of name and age. Now, Python does have different data types. You can see this is a string and this is an integer. An integer is a whole number, a float would be a decimal number, and a string is text. You can also get Boolean values, that is true or false. Now, I have an example here for you, which I will copy and paste in. You can see an integer would be 10, a float would be 3.14, the string would be hello, and Boolean would be true. Stored inside the variable is Python fun, and again, stored inside the variable of greeting and so forth. Now let's try conditionals. If I say my age is equal to 18, then if age is, remember that above there is an integer stored inside a variable called age, if age is greater than or equal to 18, enter, print, you're grown up. Else, back at the beginning here, print, you're not. And let's run this. What do you think it's going to do? Well, it's going to say you're grown up. But if I change this to 12 years old, it's going to say you're not grown. And that's another use of variables. You can use it in this conditional logic here. Now, the syntax for that is you're going to want to use tabs. And these white spaces is what we do to differentiate blocks in the code. So if I was to put this all the way back here, like this, and then run it, it actually wouldn't work because I didn't use the indentation after the if block or the if statement. So following these colons here, you're always going to want to indent it on the next line. However, fortunately, if you're in an IDE like this, as soon as I hit tab, it's going to automatically do that for me. Another great reason for using PyCharm. What about if I wanted to repeat something lots and lots of times? If I wanted to loop it, that's called using a loop. So let's here use a for loop. Now I have got an example which I've prepared over here. For i in range 5, print inside a formatted string. This is loop number i. Now, what do you think this is going to do? Take a little bit of a guess and let's hit run. You can see it's actually gone from zero all the way to four, which brings us into an important element of Python, that indexing always starts at zero. That means Python doesn't count starting from one. The first item in a list will always be zero, and that's why it's finished here at four. Now i, and we discussed variables earlier, is a temporary variable used to store an integer value of a current position in a range. So you could use any other variable name in place of i, such as count or x. So let's do x here and then put x there as well. i is just common convention. You'll see anything will work. In fact, I could even put hello for hello in range 5, print hello. Now, what you'll want to do is make sure your code is readable. So you could put something like for num in range 5, num. But again, i is just convention. So let's talk about functions. Functions are where you want to organize your code into reusable pieces. Let's create one. Now, every time you start a function, you start it with def, D-E-F. So you're defining a function and then the name of it. We're going to call it greet. Now, inside this function, I'm going to want to call name. Colon, next line. We're actually going to print inside an F string. We should be quite familiar with this now, although don't worry if you're not. Print, hello name. If I do this, let's press run, nothing's going to happen. It's because I haven't actually called the function. To call a function, you just write its name. And then inside these brackets here, 
you can actually put in the input for here. So instead of name, I'm going to put Toby. There you go. Hello, Toby. But again, I could put anything here and it would then assume that this is the name because it goes function name, function name. You see what I mean? You could also do something a little bit like this. So say I didn't have anything inside those brackets, so I'll just leave it blank. And instead of it being an F string, I just put hello. When I then call this function, it's just going to say hello. Now, one other thing I do want to quickly cover is inputs, because that could be useful as well. Let's go back to what we had here. Let's say I had a function that printed hello, Toby. And again, that put that inside a formatted F string. What I want to do first is get an input. So if I say that someone's name is equal to an input of what is your name? And then call that name here. And then call the function. It'll ask me, what's your name? Toby. Hello, Toby. You've learned how to install Python, set up an IDE, and some fundamental programming concepts. What I will say is I have a bunch of materials taking you from absolute beginner, covering a lot more than we have today, all the way to machine learning and visualization expert using data analysis. And you can even grab the bundle for a massive discount. Now let's dive into more foundational Python features, exploring powerful libraries like pandas, and even tackling some beginner projects. So let's jump right in. So let's start with lists. Think of lists as a way to store multiple items in one place. For example, we could store the list in a variable called fruits. Now, what we want to do here, the syntax is to use square brackets. So inside of fruits, rather than just storing one thing, such as apple, I want to store apple, banana, if we can spell that correctly, banana, and then also cherry as well. Now, if I was to then print fruits out just like this, it would give me each and every single one of these. So let me just print fruits. And you can see at the bottom of my screen, I've got the apple, banana and cherry. Now, what I could also do is index it. Remember, the first item in the index is always zero. So if inside square brackets, just like there is here, I put zero and run it, I'll get just apple at the bottom. You can also loop through a list. So for fruit in fruits, we want to print fruit, which sounds quite convoluted, but it will be fine. What do you think that would do? Make sure that we give it the same variable name. Now, what it's done here is it's actually listed it for all the items in this list. It's listed the list that many times. So that's why there's three outputs down there. So that's looping through a list, but you could also modify it. Let's say we wanted to append the fruits list. All we would do is we would call it and then do the dot append method inside here, adding orange. And now when we do print fruits, just like this, you can see we have all the same stuff except equally we have orange at the end. Next, we want to talk about dictionaries. These are like labeled lists and they're perfect for storing data with key value pairs. For example, if we had a variable called person, this time rather than square brackets like a list, a dictionary is in curly brackets. We want to put name, colon, Toby, again inside quotation marks. And then again, we'll put age, colon, 25. So now if we were to print person here, but only call the name, it would also output the relevant item of Toby. If we were to call the age, it would output 25. You could also add new data like this. So if I went down here and I said person hobby is equal to watching videos, then I print the person again. can see down here we have watching videos added to the dictionary. Fantastic. So just continuing and again I do want to just show you that it would work just like this as well. So let's put hobby 
and we'll get the corresponding output watching videos. Let's talk about tuples and set. Now tuples and sets are two types of data which are worth knowing about. Tuples are like lists, but they're immutable. That means they can't be changed. Sets are an unordered collection with no duplicates. So what does that mean? Well, let's say I have a tuple called my tuple. Let's do this within curly brackets, not square, not curly, sorry, ordinary brackets. And inside here, let's put one, two, and three. Then if we were to print the tuple here, my, and I can press the tab to auto complete that, calling the first item in that list, what do you think it's going to output? Well, it's going to be two, because again, it starts at zero. Now that's a tuple, again, because it's immutable. You can't then add anything to it. But if we were to look at my set, again, we'll call it my set. This one is inside curly brackets, one, two, three, and three. If we were then to print my set, let me hit tab. It'll actually only give three once, as you'll see down here at the bottom. Again, because it will not store duplicates. Next, we want to talk about importing libraries. Now, Python has libraries, and these are pre-written code blocks that make tasks easier. So let's take a look at one example, which is pandas, heavily used in data analysis. Now, the way to install a library is heading all the way down here to the terminal. Now, inside this terminal, within this virtual environment, what you'll want to type is pip for pip, followed by install, and then the name of the library, which is pandas. Let's hit enter. And you'll see it'll take a moment, but what it's doing is it's installing that so we can access it in our file. And there we go, pandas is now installed into this virtual environment. Now, libraries are what makes Python really special. So once we've installed it, we then need to import it. And we do that with import, import pandas as, and it's convention to reference it as PD. By doing that, we're then able to use the library. So one example would be reading a data set. So say we had a variable called data frame or DF for short. That could be assigned to PD or pandas dot read underscore or underscore Excel, and you can see it gives you all the available options here. Inside brackets, the name of your Excel file, uh, let's say it's called data.xlsx, and then hit run. Now, in this instance, it's actually going to tell us that it can't find that file. That's because we don't have a file called that. That's how you would work with it. And we use this a lot in my Pandas course. I have a whole workbook dedicated to it because it's so crucial for data analytics, but we won't be getting into that today. There are some inbuilt libraries such as math. If we were to import math, we could then do something, for example, print the square root of 16. So let's do that here. Print math and then call the method square root of 16 and hit run and we'll get it down here. So fantastic. Let's scroll up a little bit. There we go, four. Okay. So let's move on here as well. Now we've briefly covered quite a lot of fundamental elements of Python. There's a few more things to go before we get to the projects. So let's look at error handling. Try and accept blocks help you gracefully manage any mistakes that you've made. So let's give you one example here. Let's say I want to try number is equal to an integer, meaning this input here has to take in a whole number, otherwise it won't work. And the input is going to be enter a number. I'm going to put a space after this. Then I'm going to go to the next line. And I want to print just, well, number. Except if I did this and I was to enter a number, let's see what that error is here. Uh, because I didn't add my accept block. We then want to add accept here as well. But before we get to that, let's just do this like this. So if I was to run this, and then type in a number such as three and hit run, it will say three, great. But if I was to run it and write a word, it's gonna have an error. So this is an instance where we would actually want to have this try block. So we can add an accept condition. We can say accept if there's a value error, then print, 
Uh, uh, uh. You made a mistake. Or whatever you'd like to say. You know those messages you get when you're trying to create a password or something? Yeah, we get those all the time. Um, let's see what the issue is here. Because it did actually say there was a problem. There was an issue with the accept block. So, it's because I spelt it wrong. Accept. There we go. So now let's put in any random gibberish and it's going to say, look, you've made a mistake. And now with all of that out of the way, there are a few more elements like automation, reading and writing to files, but we cover that in my more complex videos. We're going to look at a beginner project. So what I want to do for you today is make a basic calculator and then we'll do a to-do list app. And then if you want to look at some data analysis with pandas, again, that's all in my workbooks and in other videos as well. So let's get right to it. I'm going to create a function called calculator. Now what calculator is going to do, it's not going to store anything in it, but it's going to hold a few variables. One being operation, and this is going to be assigned to an input, which just says, you know, choose whether you want to add, subtract, multiply, or divide. So choose add, subtract, multiply, or divide. There we go. Then I'm going to call num1. And it's going to be a float because that means it can be a decimal number. It doesn't have to be an integer. They might put 3.5, for example. It is going to be an input. And it's going to say, you know, enter the first number. And then again, what I can do is just copy and paste this entire line. But just change it. So it becomes num2. Enter the next number. Brilliant. Now, again, still within this indentation because it's in the same block of code. We're going to want to say if operation is equal to not a sign so these are different things when you do one equals it actually means it's assigning it so this is this equals sort of means it's the same as so if equal equals i mean is add so if it's the same as add or here we call it plus then what i want to do is within another indentation print and this is a mathematical operation num1 plus num2 Else if the operation is equal equals to subtract, which here was that. We can also do some error handling here as well. Then you print num1 minus num2 and, and so forth and so forth. So I actually have this because I don't want to waste your time already written out here. This is exactly what we just did. I think in this example, I actually wrote out the words. The only thing I did differently is I added the dot lower method. That means if I was to write subtract in all capital letters um, and it was to then look for that, if I didn't have the dot lower method, it would treat them as different things because it's case sensitive. So what this is doing, it's saying, right, I'm going to take whatever you give me and make it, force it to be lowercase. That's what this dot method uh, is here. And then we do have an else right at the end that says, look, anything else, just say that's an invalid operation. So <laughs> let's hit run here. I'm going to say that I want to add. And my first number is 10, my next number is 5, and let's have a look. There you go, the result is 15. Brilliant. That's really good, but what if I wanted to do something like, I don't know, less number-based, more writing? Let's say a to-do list app to manage our tasks. This will teach you about lists, loops, and user input. So let's delete all of this. We're going to create a list called task. It's going to store nothing at the moment. Then we're going to say while well, true, that's a Boolean value, action is equal to the input, choose, add, view, or quit. Then if action is assigned to add, what we want to do is then indent it, say that task is equal to the input, enter a task. This is a new variable we're creating here, and we'll do that too. What we're going to then do is use tasks, so that's this list up here, dot append with the task. You can see when you click on something, it'll actually show you what it's referencing. And tasks should actually be tasks. There you go. That makes more sense now. So these are independent things. This is task and this is tasks. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to go back one and I'm going to say else if action is equal equal to view, then all I want to do is just print out the tasks. So let's print out tasks, which is that list at the beginning. Else if action is equal to quit, then I want to end it. And the easiest way to do that 
is draw a little line, just break. Finally, my last condition is going to be else. I want to print because they might say something else. This is my error handling um, invalid option. So let's have a look at that. Let's run it. I'm then going to choose. So if I just quit it, I can quit it. If I was to add something to it, I could say record this video. You see, it's going to loop because I haven't braked yet. Uh, I'm then going to say, look, I want to view it. It's going to be record this video. I'm then going to quit. Now, thank you very much for watching and all the best.